right. So our next speaker is Craig Hudson. So Craig Hudson is a design engineer leader at Garmin. Well known for their diverse GPS devices, the Garmin facility in Salem concentrates on aircraft display systems, as well as navigation, communication, and surveillance equipment. Craig has a diverse portfolio of design experience across the entire organization and holds multiple patents on communication and aircraft tracking systems. He's a private pilot and enjoys flying Garmin gear as much as designing Garmin gear. Originally from Boston, Craig has an electrical engineering degree from Northeastern University. He worked in the defense industry for several years on Navy and Air Force programs and arrived in Oregon almost 30 years ago. In his spare time, he grows Pinot Noir and is in the middle of building a solar electric car based on a 1986 Pontiac Hero. Thank you, Craig. Good morning. Wanted to have some fun this morning, and I'm making the assumption that everyone here is going to be an engineer. So I'm diving in to sort of challenge you all with, you know, where is the future going and how are you going to contribute? And where do you contribute? So I've got CNS, Communication, Navigation, and Surveillance basically the, how we fly aircraft and how we keep aircraft safe in the skies. But really the key word here is autonomous aircraft. And I want you to think with me for a little bit here in the next 10 minutes or so about what is autonomous aircraft? How do we fly safely in that world? So my first question is, right, there we go, autonomous. So. In the sense of autonomous, what is autonomous? Um, out of the dictionary, we're basically trying to work a computer as smart as the human could be. And what I mean by that is we have opportunities where intelligence has to be brought together and the computer is going to take that ahead for us. So navigated and maneuvered by a computer without the need for human control. The addition to that that I add is to achieve safe operation. And intrinsically, when you get on an aircraft, when you're leaving Portland, heading somewhere, you want to arrive at your destination safely. So if we could somehow distill the computer and our brains together, what would it look like? Sort of like one of these little Intel chips with a brain built in? But it's, it's more than that, right? It's, it's how that all interacts together. And it's, it's you as a designer, as a design engineer, in all different disciplines that come together to create a system. So let's think about the aircraft world that we live in today. There's all types of aircraft out there. Down at the low level, we have small aircraft, general aviation, single engine, propeller driven aircraft, single engine jets, big commercial aircraft that are carrying people across the country. And then if you think about all the things in between that, that fill that space, you might have aircraft at high levels that are balloons or dirigibles. There's been a lot of talk about bringing internet to the, to the world and the way to do that is not through an infrastructure like we have, but maybe through some sort of a, a floating platform. And how do all these interact together is a real big question that needs to be solved. We think about the air traffic systems that we have today and the Federal Aviation Administration manages about 7,000 aircraft at any one point in time. So you can imagine, how would you do that autonomously? The FAA has about 50,000 people working for it. Now granted, they're not all working to keep aircraft separated, but they all are part of that system of safety that wraps around aircraft and aviation. So dream with me a little bit. What does the future look like for aviation? This is just an artist's conception. Instead of having a parking garage out there, you have something that would be a, a heliport. And that heliport could be something that is as sophisticated or as simple as an aircraft that you would climb in that you would fly to and from home. I know coming up here this morning there was a huge traffic jam on 217 and I don't have the <clears throat> pleasure to be in that traffic every day but I'm sure some moms and dads out there of yours 
have to sit in that traffic, and it's, it's something that we could, you could, have a solution for. So this isn't necessarily a helicopter like we think of today, more like maybe a, a quadcopter, uh, if you're into UAVs and drones, something that lifts with multiple rotors. So there's a lot of neat concepts of where we could go. Who's pioneering autonomous vehicles, right? We've heard a little bit about Google, Wemo. The Google car has the ability to basically travel wherever it wants without any human interaction. It has the smarts, the intelligence, the sensors that kind of build a system and create a safe system for it to kind of autonomously navigate. Now with an automobile, you have, shall we say, two degrees of freedom. You can go forward and backwards, right and left, but you don't have any elevation in there. Aircraft kind of play the next step, which would be adding elevation. You have a problem with your Google car, and you could pull over to the side of the road. And there's a lot of automotive manufacturers that are chasing concepts like this, and we're, we're seeing some of that today. You're going to see a huge revolution in the world of autonomous navigation and autonomous vehicles and how you drive. Maybe this is a concept, something sleek, something aerodynamic, something that could transition from driving on the road to spreading those wings and flying in the sky. Pretty awesome, exactly. Yeah, so you could get from point to point very quickly with great speed, and if you brought in the computer technology and the sensors, you could have a very safe experience getting from one place to another. But is this real or is this imaginary? Imaginary, yeah. Maybe someday? Well, this summer in Dubai, there's a taxi service going to be launched. This is what they call a dual quadcopter, and it has redundancy in that each leg has two propellers on it with two motors, and this is going to move people from one part of Dubai to another. Now, Dubai is, is a you know, rather unusual part of the world. They have some very amazing things and quite a bit of money and infrastructure to put in place. But this is a taxi service. You can go from one side of the city to the other in a quadcopter. Happens to have a little more sophistication than that. But these type of air vehicles are gonna be happening in your lifetime. And my challenge to you all is to think about how are you gonna participate in that? How are you as designers gonna be inventing the new materials that provide structure and strength, the computers and the software and the safety systems that will allow these things to operate in our, in our airspace and provide a safe transportation method. So let's get into some of the design specifications. Let's think about what does it take to keep aircraft safe? What does it take to keep all those things working sort of together? And I've got kind of a simple thing here. I started my presentation by talking about communication, navigation, and surveillance. Communication is drawn in blue, one aircraft speaking to the other in a data link, not too dissimilar than you talking with a friend on a cell phone. Also, at the same time, there's a radio station on the ground receiving that information and processing it and knowing where the location of those aircraft are. They get their location through the yellow lines coming down from a satellite. I think we all know about GPS navigation, right? So GPS provides a position. The data link provides a way to get that, permit, that position from aircraft to aircraft and aircraft to ground. And then for redundancy, we have the red lines, which is known as surveillance, air traffic control, where there's actually a, a basically a, looks like a, a spinning fence in the air, and that fence goes around and it's similar to a lighthouse, whereas the light goes across the air, the, the sea, and a boat can see the light, air traffic control, as that radio signal spans the sky, it gets a reflection off the aircraft, and that provides the surveillance or the tracking of that aircraft. So this is our navigation, our communication, and our surveillance kind of system. So, oops, apologize. So with autonomous aircraft as our goal, let's go through and think about those. Navigation, communication, and surveillance. Navigation is simple, that's the GPS side of it. We know they're out there. There's a lot of, of 
uh, history behind GPS and providing a, a good signal. There's a lot of new technologies going into that where they're looking at dual frequencies and ways to make it smaller, more reliable, ways to get the accuracy improved. So these are all things that you could have as a, as a job, as a profession, is working on the satellite segment of, of navigation. The next step is communication. Communication is the connection from, as I said earlier, cell phone to cell phone, or in an aircraft sense, you have a VHF radio to another VHF radio. And the last one is this surveillance piece. And their surveillance piece is, is this sort of radar system. And this is where I want to spend the next few minutes of, of thinking about how our radar system works. So as a design engineer, we talked a few minutes ago about the 7,000 aircraft that the FAA monitor. And they're not at saturation, but with this kind of technology, once you get into the dense environment of like Los Angeles or um, what they would consider kind of rush hour around Chicago, and which is O'Hare Airport, or down into Atlanta, down into Dallas-Fort Worth, LaGuardia, and JFK, these large, huge hub air airports, we really run into a, a saturation problem where we just can't seem to keep those aircraft apart, and we have to sort of separate them by time. And that's not going to work well. We're going to have traffic jams, essentially. But there are systems that need to be, I'll say, dreamt up. And you think about how this kind of an environment is sort of self-separated. Birds fly in huge flocks. Have you ever gone by a, a place where there's a, a huge sort of cluster of starlings and you kind of beep your horn as you go by and the, the starlings will kind of rise almost in unison, make a large circle and swarm and then come, come back down and land. It's an amazing kind of sight. They don't have air traffic controllers doing that. They, they just sort of self-separate. So I think there's huge potential and a great horizon out there for individuals like yourself to go out there and think up what are the next generation technologies that go into surveillance. <coughs> surveillance is, is really collision avoidance, right? You're trying to maintain separation between you and the other aircraft and make sure that that's a safe system. So we spoke a little bit about radar, basically being on the surface looking up, kind of like that lighthouse and a beacon. The light goes around and it circles and it picks up each aircraft one after the other after the other. This has sort of been in existence since the 1950s. The next step of that is something that we call um, broadcasted surveillance. And this is sort of like each aircraft transmitting its, its position. This is something that I've been working on the last mm, perhaps 15 years now. And uh, we now have a system that's going to be essentially fully operational in about 2020. And that's something that the FAA has been working on. Um, a lot of companies participating in that from a technology development standpoint. So the next step beyond you know, radar going to sort of broadcasted surveillance is this autonomous nature. You have this huge flock of birds that can do it, how do we do it as a society? How do we self-separate aircraft? So there's some technologies out there, mostly sensors, right? And the sensors, you're aware of some of them. You're just going to think about where they're at. If you think about things that can look at heat, we can measure heat and then potentially identify something just by its heat signature. We can also look at it and try and identify it with uh, light. So these are our forward-looking infrared detection and the other ones are sort of light detection and ranging. These are technologies that are going into a lot of our autonomous cars. And you'll see this growing in a lot of different places, aviation being one specific. And then maybe once you go beyond that, you think about the next step of this using radar, but not so much radar from the ground, but radar on each aircraft. And we're doing that with automatic braking in the automotive market. Basically looking ahead with a radar signal, it ranges the car in front of you, and from there it applies braking. So you can have, you know, essentially a safe operation on the freeways. And then the last one would be maybe ultrasonic. And I'm just thinking out, what does ultrasonic look like? A bat sends out a chirp. That chirp bounces off everything in its path. 
And then it has a right ear and a left ear, so it has a stereo capability, and it can detect distance and azimuth, angle of where that particular obstruction might be. How do we apply that to aviation? You know, bats have done it and done it successfully for, for millennia. And the next one is, is really maybe, what are your thoughts? Where could we go? What kind of sensors are there out there that haven't been invented yet? What are the sensors that, that you see um, in other areas? Places that might be something that you've had a connection with through medical, automotive, toys, um, any kind of electronics. There's a lot of things out there that haven't been thought of. And that's the fundamental, I'll say, sort of, you know, what engineering is all about. Solving problems, and solving problems before you even know there was a problem out there. You're putting a new solution together. Did we need fancy um, uh, cell phones that have great internet connectivity and, and 5G kind of connections? No, but they sure have made our life a lot funner and a lot more interesting. Um, it wasn't long ago that flip phones were around, and bef before that, a bag phone, and before that, no phone. So there's going to be a huge growth in sort of technology and how it applies to all the things that are ahead of you uh, going into engineering professions. So my last few slides kind of dive in and talk a little bit about exactly that. How do you go from where you're at today into engineering? There's a lot of specifics that you can go into for an engineer. You can become an industrial engineer, or a mechanical engineer, or an electrical engineer. Um, and that's just a degree that starts you on that path. And then once you take and finish that curriculum, you're going to go off to industry and gain some experience. And it's really at that experience level that you then can kind of see that there are a lot of different areas that you can call a job and a career. And your career will change over the years as well. But I want to highlight a few up here and just talk about them because there's not a college program out there for a, a systems engineer or a flight test engineer. So you have to think about the end game of where you want to go and what are the building blocks to get you there. They start with the basics of a, of a Bachelor of Science in Engineering, and it's just one of the disciplines that the universities can provide you that will start your path. So I'll finish up here by sort of talking about the future. And what does that future look like? Because it's not my vision of what it looks like, it's really your vision of what it might look like. What kind of materials do we need to develop that would be flexible enough and strong enough to prevent to provide the ability for an aircraft to change form. You know, you have you know, toys and games and things that show transformers. Hollywood does an amazing job of showing us capabilities that don't exist yet, but yet they do because we come about them because we find solutions to them. And what are the sort of integrated circuits, as we call them chips, what are the chips that need to be developed to provide small enough power, I guess I'll say sensitive enough, and um, advance the technology that's, a, that's out there in terms of sensors and speed of computing. There's a lot of neat things that you'll be doing that um, will open up the world and provide you know, tremendous things. Changes in, in, my case, aviation, but changes in all kinds of walks of life. With that, I'll kind of conclude with a little bit of, of who I am and what I did, and then open it up for questions. So my journey was through the Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering, and um, I went to a, a university in Boston, which was what we called cooperative education. Uh, Oregon State, Portland State, um, University of Portland, OIT, have a program called MECOP, which puts together a program for co-op where you're working as an intern. And uh, it's a great way to kind of learn a little bit about what you might do as an engineer. Um, I worked for four years at a, a company in Massachusetts while I was going to school, which was a great learning experience for me. And then ended up at Texas Instruments and then down in Salem for the last 
well, the last many years, coming up on 30 now. But it's been a great journey and a lot of fun uh, for me. And um, as I have had a chance to sort of work on things that were bringing aircraft surveillance through broadcasted data link information, I see tremendous future for, you know, where technology will take us and where you'll bring us in the next 20 years. So how about questions? Down on the front row? I heard some people are working on making the flying cars. So how, how close are, or far away are you to reaching that goal? Yeah, I think um, from the standpoint of, of flying cars, we're, we're very close. I mean, the cars that can drive themselves. And cars that can drive themselves. Um, on, on, the, on the ground, on terrestrial side, I would say we're essentially there. We're very, very close to having cars that will essentially drive themselves. When it comes to aircraft, we're a few years away. We're going to have a big question of safety in the sky. And that's really where it comes down to this, you know, surveillance and collision avoidance. Because it works great if you're the only one up there, but as soon as you get, you know, more than one, it gets a little complicated. Traffic lights for the sky, and you have to hover while the other traffic passes. <laughs> Good. Other questions? So, uh, going back to your Dubai example, was that taxi service uh, unmanned? Yeah, there's, there's a lot of uh, discussion on that. Um, I'm sure when they start out, it's going to be manned, but their goal is to go unmanned. The reason they want to go unmanned is weight. If you put another person on board, you've got to have that much you know, larger battery, that much greater lift, that much larger aircraft. So it's going to be unmanned, but it'll probably be, um, I'm not sure how they're going to do it when they start. But okay. keep your eyes open for that. I'm excited to see that happen in the summer. All right. And also, so when, obviously in Dubai, they're a lot richer than the average American, and they have helipads everywhere. If we were to take that idea and bring it here, would that just be more of a civil engineering problem, figuring out how that would work around? Like every building has a rooftop. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, not so, like suburban America or... Right. So what I, what I would see is uh, the slide I put up that shows uh, a um, sort of a parking garage that would become a heliport. I think that would be a fantastic concept. You know, you'd have a central location, just like we have a bus terminal today or an airport today. But with, with rotor technology, you can come right into the city and, and land. You don't want to bring a rotor down onto the, onto the ground because you get tremendous, you know, you know just it's a lot of, a lot of air you have to push out from underneath the aircraft to get the aircraft in the, in the air. All right, thank you. No, good questions. How about others? I see one over here. Good, yell, yell out and I'll kind of repeat it for you. How long to the, the flying cars are? How many years does it take to make those flying cars? Yeah, I think flying cars were sort of conceptualized in the 1960s, a few years before you guys were all born, right? So we've had about 50 years of people sort of hypothesizing about what is a flying car and when will I have my flying car in my own personal garage. Um, there's still a few more, how do we say, technology, technological advances that have to be made, both in terms of um, uh, you know, speed and power, uh, weight is a big thing. Um, and all that translates into the distance you can travel. If you think about your, your automobile, well, think about electric cars for a minute. Electric cars have, have a finite range, right? So the range is tied to the lithium batteries typically on board. And um, then how quickly you can recharge those batteries. If we could find a battery technology that would be like instantly charged, very similar to when you pull into a gas station and you just kind of pour the gasoline in your tank, then the range issue, the range anxiety, as they say, would go away. And we're, we're going to see that, I think, change in the next maybe, you know, five or ten years. Definitely in your professional careers, we'll see that change. And when it comes to flying cars, I think the biggest challenge is how you would get all those, think about the traffic jam that's on I, or on uh, 217 this morning. Um, there's just a lot of congestion when you try and move. The Portland Metroplex has some clo somewhere close to 2 million people. All those people are moving to get to work for 8 o'clock. 
get to school for 7.30, whatever the dates and times are. So there's just a lot of big crush times. If we can move ourselves to a, a distributed work environment where you're working from home or working from an area which is you know, less than a one large factory or one large technology tower and work spread it out, that would be kind of neat. You could actually move people away from the city and have those um, uh, airports, heliports uh, positioned so you can move people back and forth a little easier. Question in the middle. So you talked a lot about um, autonomous vehicles um, and autonomous aircrafts. Um, and uh, so a lot of the aircrafts, like commercial aircrafts that are flying people are already almost all the way automated. So could you give a little more clarification on what you mean by complete, do you mean like complete autonomy or just like what we have now just on a greater scale? Yeah, good question. So um, what you're bringing up is that we have um, something that, that we call auto land for uh, many of the commercial aircraft. Um, auto land uh, is, a, is a, a technology that was, has been developed over the last maybe 10 years or so, and it allows an aircraft to come in and uh, visually acquire the, uh, the, the airport by the pilot in command. And as he can visually acquire the air, the airport and the airport environment, uh, he can then allow the computer to continue on down its path for landing. And then when you get further and closer towards landing, uh, they have what they call a, a decision height, um, where at that point you're either going to land or you're going to do what they call a missed approach or a go around. Um, all those capabilities are, uh, are there and available in a computer. And now we need to pull the human, or could we, maybe is the question, could we pull the human out of the loop and let the computer do all the work by itself? We're going to see that happen, clearly. We have a shortage of pilots um, in, in the world. There's just not enough pilots for the number of aircraft that are potentially growing and coming about. I think the question that was raised earlier in the front rows about having a, uh, a sort of a flying car uh, will only happen if we can truly have autonomous flight and the ability for an aircraft to, well, basically you get on, on board your little personal transportation system, happens to have wings, happens to have a rotor or something that will propel you there. And you basically just punch in the coordinates or you just type in Sunset High School or you just speak it. Or maybe you just think it. Hey, I need to go to school today. Or maybe it just knows I need to go to school today. And it just says, you know, climb on board, welcome, Johnny. And it just brrr, takes you there. I think all those autonomous features are going to come about, but there's always the check and the balance associated with having a human in the loop today to ensure safety. And that, that human in the loop is, uh, is an important element, we think, today. But computers are getting smarter. We're going to see um, definitely in the next few years, definitely in your lifetime, uh, automobiles um, and insurance rates potentially are going to come down for cars that have autonomous driving capabilities or autonomous braking capabilities because they're, they're safer and have fewer accidents and fewer accidents means lower premiums and so there's going to be a change in, uh, in how we drive. There may be a time in the future where you can't get on I-5 unless you have um, self-separation capabilities in your automobile. You know, you get one of them old time cars, you know, pre-2025 cars. Um, and you can't get on I-5 because you don't have autonomous separation. Who knows? It's going to change, though. It's going to change. And it's going to change under your auspices and, and, and how you see it happening and what you're willing to tolerate, all right? Right now, we have the safest uh, transportation system, aircraft transportation system in the world. You don't hear about aircraft falling out of the sky. Um, you don't think about uh, getting on an aircraft and taking off from Portland and landing in wherever it happens to be and not landing, or not landing safely. It happens occasionally, but not typically in the United States, kind of knock on wood. But it, it is, we have a very safe system. And that's in part thanks to the redundancies and the professionals that manage the air traffic control system and, um, and, and really uh, monitor the aircraft on a continuous basis. All right, thank you very much. Good, good luck.